Our Father, we thank you for this time again. We're asking that you speak to our hearts. We're asking that you lay your hand upon everyone Amen. and bless us in your riches in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with us together now. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. For the brief moment before us, I want to talk on an important subject, which I believe is something that we who are workers in the vineyard of the Lord need to understand so that we'll be able to see how many times many people have their blessings delayed unknowingly. And I believe that as we look at this word of God today, many things will change in our personal lives in Jesus' name. And where we have been experiencing defeat or suffering, as we see the secret of the Lord for the remedy for the believer's suffering, all these sufferings will be taken away from our lives in Jesus' name. Much of our suffering can be avoided and life can become more meaningful and exciting after we become Christians we become heirs of God joint heirs with Christ and we are redeemed from the curse of the law not only that we are also delivered from the works of Satan and so many of the things that happen to us in the way of suffering, in the way of sickness, in the way of problems, can be avoided if we see the secret and the remedy from the Word of God. First, before I talk to you why some of us who are Christians, workers, and even ministers, why we sometimes suffer, I want you to see our heritage in the Word of God so that you will know your right your gospel right your redemptive right your family right your blood bought right that the devil has no business and has no right to deny you all and yet after we have seen all these rights our redemptive our family our gospel our blood bought rights we will then see why sometimes some of these redemptive rights or inheritances are not given unto us? Or why we do not enjoy them? And how we can take the hindrances out of the way and begin to enjoy them. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. We are heirs of God. All the promises of God are made for us. We have a claim on them. More than the people of the world, sinners have any claim on the promises of the Lord. Christ is ours by faith. He is our Savior. He is our Shepherd. He is our Provider. And we are joint heirs with Him. Then it says, if we are joint heirs with Him, we shall be glorified together with Him. Even though we suffer with him now, we labor with him now, we bear reproach with him now. Then in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
We are assured here that we are not under the curse. The curse of the law. Every form of curse has been removed from us. And yet, you will find out later that there are people that still suffer underneath the weight or the load of a curse. Why? We'll discover that, and by the grace of God, we'll show the way for the remedy. It says, for us who are believers, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Christ has been made a curse for us. Then, that after we have been redeemed from the curse of the law, we should inherit and enjoy the blessing of Abraham through Jesus Christ. In 3rd John, 3rd epistle of John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth, if we have become a beloved of the Lord, a person that is loved of God, and that love of God manifested in Calvary has become efficacious for us, that we are covered in that love, we are provided for in that love. There are three areas of blessing we should not be denied of. One, spiritual blessing. As thy soul prospereth, we should not be experiencing stagnancy in our spiritual lives. We should not be experiencing backsliding in our Christian lives. We should be making progress. We should be having spiritual prosperity. We should be experiencing the presence of the Lord all the time. Then two, we should be in health. There should be no sickness within us. God, through Christ, has dealt with the sickness problem on the cross of Calvary. And therefore, we should be in health. We should enjoy health, strength, vitality. And we should be able to do everything the Lord has ordained for us to do. Then it says we should have prosperity, plenty, abundance. Because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask and all that we think through the power that worketh in us. We're told that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So then we have these areas of blessing, prosperity, health, spiritual blessing. And so, we should find out if we are not enjoying all these blessings, why are we not enjoying them? Why are we not having them? So that we'll be able to know the way back into the blessings of God. In Exodus chapter 23, Exodus 23, from verse 25. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and ye shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Sometimes, you know, brothers and sisters, when we read the word of God, like this. We might just uh, overlook the promise because we've been suffering for a long time. But I want to encourage you that in Bible days, there were people that suffered for 40 years. You remember the man in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. He was born in that difficulty. Paralysis. And even though 40 years had gone by, after those 40 years, the deliverance and the healing came. You will remember the woman that had suffered for 12 years, who had been bleeding. After those 12 years, she still claimed the promise of the Lord. And many times for us, we find that if we have suffered for some time, 
and we read a promise of the Lord like this, unconsciously we overlook and bypass that promise of God. But understand, even though 12 years or 18 years concerning the woman that was bowed down with the spirit of infirmity, or 40 years with the man who was born lame, even though 40 years or 18 years or 38 years, like the man in John chapter 5, or past 12 years have passed, whenever we read the promise of God, we should still allow the Spirit of God to apply that promise to our situation. Ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take away sickness from the midst of thee. I believe the Lord will do it. Then it says in verse 26, There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. Do you know that Christian workers who are serving the Lord, who are ministering to the needs of other people, that we have some promises beyond even other people? If you look at these verses of scripture, it says, He will bless your bread. He will bless your water because you are serving the Lord. Which means, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, knowing that you will not drink poison, and you will not deliberately eat something that is spoiled, it says, He will bless your water and He will bless your bread. Then that He will take sickness from the midst of you and that nothing will cast their young. It is not to look at yesterday or last year and say, but I had miscarriage. What the Lord is telling you is that whatever happened in the past, this is the promise He's giving you today. This is the promise He's giving you for the present hour. And then He says, the number of thy days I will fulfill. A Christian worker should not be living in a constant fear of premature death. I will fulfill the number of your days. A Christian worker should not be fearing the possibility of accident. We're not talking about what might have happened yesterday or what happened last year or what happened some months ago to other people. We're talking about God's present loving care and promise for today. And if you believe it, it will be according to it will be to you according to your faith. In verse 27, I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. Christian people, do not fear witches and wizards, especially preachers of the gospel. Especially the people that are using all their time, all their talent, all that they have for the propagation of the gospel. It says, I will put my fear before thee. He will do it. That before you get to where you are going, the people that might have been bragging and boasting against your life, God will plant your fear in their heart. He will be an enemy to your enemies. Which means then, we who are ministers of the gospel. When I say ministers of the gospel, you are a house leader, you are ministering the gospel. Or you are an area leader, you are ministering the gospel. You are a woman representative or zonal leader, you are minister of the gospel. Or you are a coordinator, you are a preacher, you are a local pastor, you are a minister of the gospel. Those of us who are ministers of the gospel, workers in the vineyard of the Lord, ought to know that he that touches us, touches the apple of the eye of the Lord. He will protect you. He will not forget any of his own. If he doesn't protect you, who will preach the gospel? If he doesn't take care of your life, who will preach the gospel? If he does not provide for your need, who will preach the gospel? If he does not encourage you and lift you up, who will preach the gospel? He needs us. Because he needs us, he will take care of us. He loves us. He knows how much we love him. He will take care of us. In Matthew chapter 6, 
from verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith that shall we be clothed? It is uh, something that is the weakness of the human nature. Whenever there is austerity, drought, farming, or whenever there is retrenchment, we who are human beings, we forget that this is not the first time when farming came into some parts of the world. We, we forget that God has been protecting his own, has been feeding his own all through the time of farming. Whenever there is any difficulty in the nation, Christian people will forget this is not the first time. Remember, please, that farming had been in history from the beginning. You remember the time of Abraham? There was a famine. You remember the time of Jacob and all his sons? There was a famine. And you will remember the time of Elijah? There was famine. At the time of Elisha, there was famine. But God has always singled out his own. Brothers and sisters, I've been reading of recent of where God himself still multiplies food today. When we talk about miracles, many of us will think about miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance, miracles of blind eyes opening, miracles of the deaf hearing. But you know that God is performing miracles of multiplying bread today. And in the miracles that I've read of that kind, I've read of such miracles in Indonesia, in America, in Africa, in Latin America. God is doing wonderful, unbelievable, incredible things today. If he's doing it in Africa here, he can do it in your life. You can have a testimony concerning this. But Christians, Christian workers in particular, they are so bothered about what shall we eat. But Jesus said, take no thought. Do not be anxious. Do not be worried. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things there is nothing you need which the heavenly father does not know about and there is nothing you need which the heavenly father cannot supply it depends on your faith and faithfulness verse 33 but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you briefly yesterday i touched on this verse it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these, shall, all these things shall be added unto you. We should be victorious. One, over sin. Two, over sickness. Three, over all circumstances engineered by Satan. Victory over sin over sickness, over all circumstances engineered by Satan, originating from Satan. But then, why do we sometimes suffer? I'm talking particularly now about those of us who are not only children of God, we have gone a step higher. We are ministers of the gospel. Why do we sometimes suffer? Most of us and most of the time, we suffer because of disobedience. This may surprise you. Most of us suffer most of the time because of disobedience. And whatever I'm saying now, I do not say this to condemn us, to condemn ourselves, but so that we can see the root cause of our problem. And by the grace of God, we deal with the problem. And once the problem is dealt with, the suffering will be, take, will be gotten rid of. And then we'll have the remedy for believers' suffering. Let's look at Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, 
from verse 1. Now the watch of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. God saw the land, and God saw their wickedness, and God saw their sins, and he called upon Jonah, his own servant, and he said, Arise, leave every other thing you are doing, go to Nineveh. We sometimes get into trouble when God wants us to leave what we're doing and go to a modern day Nineveh and go and deliver his message. And what we happen to be doing is more significant, more important to us that we refuse to leave what we're doing. Personal interest, selfish interest, private occupation, private involvement, and we keep seated when we should be arising and going to Nineveh. And Jonah had his own reasons, whatever the reasons were. He had his reasons why he did not want to go. In verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid a fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He labored, but not in the right direction. He journeyed, but not in the right direction. He entered a boat, but not the kind of boat God wanted him to enter. And then he joined some people that were going the wrong direction, not the people he should have joined. And his suffering began. Before this time, he was free from distress. He was free from storm. He was free from disappointment. But then, the moment dis dis uh, disobedience began, disappointments began. The moment disobedience entered into his life, difficulty entered into his life. We will not know much of difficulty, much of disappointment, much of disease, if every time, every day, we say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Where should I be going today? There is no accident in the way when you are in the will of God. No accident in the will of God. No problem in the will of God. There is no incurable disease while you are in the will of God. There is no unfortunate thing that God doesn't have solution for when you are in the center of the will of God. But out of the will of God, there is darkness. Out of the will of God, there is storm. Out of the will of God, there is disease. Out of the will of God, when you are disobeying the call of God, there is going to be a stormy life, a raging life. There will be waves that will be carrying you up and down. In verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. The Lord himself, as a form of chastisement, as a form of punishment, sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. Why did God do this? He did it because of his love. There were 120,000 people that were waiting for the message of reconciliation. There were 120,000 people that were waiting for the message of life. Death was very near. Destruction was very near. Doom was very near. And God wanted those people to escape the doom, the danger, the destruction. And because of his love for them, and he had only one preacher. And that one preacher was a runaway. That one preacher was running away from the post of duty. And because of the love of God for the 120,000 people that Jonah had never seen and he didn't want to see, that Jonah had not gone to and he didn't want to go there, because of that, a storm followed after Jonah. Look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, 
wherein are more than six score. A score is 20. Six score is six times 20, 120. Six score thousand, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And also much cattle because of God's love for the 120,000 people that a single message will save, that a single message will redeem, that this minister of the gospel ought to minister unto the message of repentance, the message of reconciliation, the message of deliverance from doom and death. Because of that, when he ran away, God sent a storm after him. Maybe that's what is happening in some of our lives, our disobedience, our disregard of the message of love, the people you don't know who are waiting for your message, the 120,000 people who are to be saved by your message, they are waiting for you. And the Lord is saying, arise, go to the slum area, arise, go to the villages, arise, go to Nineveh, arise, reach out to the hospitals, arise, reach out to the school children, arise, reach out to the teeming multitudes of teenagers that are roaming about in the streets. Arise, reach out to the poor and the illiterate. Arise, reach out to the college and university students. And you say, no, I don't have any time for that now. Then the Lord sent out a great wind, chapter 1, verse 4, into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried, every man, unto his God and cast forth their wares that were in the sheep into the sea. They cast out all their property into the sea to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the sheep and he lay and was fast asleep. Jonah joined the mariners and he got the mariners into trouble. There are people that God get into trouble because they have a Jonah in their boat. You see, sometimes some people will establish a company and they will see a brother, a brother that will have taught the word of God on how to evangelize, how to talk, how to motivate, how to mobilize, how to get people to work how to encourage people, how to love people. We have taught him leadership qualities. And then he leaves the work that we trained him for, the work that God has imputed so much in his life for. And when he leaves that work, there will be somebody that will see him. And then he interviews him and sees that the man is intelligent. The man is wise. The man can mobilize. The man can motivate. And the man will say, well, what were you doing before? And the fellow will say, I used to be a zonal leader. I used to be a minister of the gospel. And he told us on how to motivate people. They told us on how to mobilize people. They taught us on how to get people to work, how to get people to be very, very productive. But uh, are you doing it on well? I just felt I needed a change. It was too much for me. And the work I started in our church, uh, that uh, the group in our church or the locality in our church, I raised them from about um, 120 people or 300 people, and I raised them up to 2,000. And the fellow will say, well, uh, can you work with me? Oh, yes. Well, join me then. And then that person with all the other workers there, they'll be like the marinas. They have employed a Jonah in their corporation. They will suffer. Because God will be after Jonah. God will not leave Jonah alone. Why? Because he loves Jonah. Because he loves you. And because he loves the people that you ought to reach. You see all these people, they got into trouble. Because Jonah was in their boat. You know sometimes, there are some ladies in the world, they are unbelievers. They do not know what God intends for a particular man. It may be in the office that you see this man is always talking right, is always gentle, is always caring for people. They do not know that that is a quality of an evangelist, that God is raising up that man as an evangelist. And these some believing ladies will say, Ah, Mr. So and so, you look so nice. You look always encouraging. 
And anybody that is getting discouraged, anytime you talk to that individual, the person will, you know, will just get up and say, well, thank God, uh, uh, Mr. So-and-so has encouraged me. There is no problem in that corporation, in that factory. If the manager cannot handle it, they'll call, they say, Mr. So-and-so, come. You see, we have difficulty now. All these workers, they are threatening that they are going to, uh, you know, they are going to leave all the work and they are just going to down to us and run back home. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, I'm a manager, I don't know what I will do. These people, they are going to break all the machines and they are going to destroy all the cars. And Mr. So-and-so happens to be a Christian worker. And we have been teaching him on how to calm the people down, how to use all these methods. And he says, manager, don't, don't worry about it. Just leave me alone. And then he'll get all the workers together and I will talk to them and comfort them and encourage them like Moses encouraging people, like Elijah encouraging people, and then he will pray for them and say everything will change, and then he will talk to this. That's what he has been doing in the church. He has been talking to the coordinators about the problems of people in the zone, and then he will talk to the zonal members. The zonal people, they'll get encouraged and say, well, we'll go to church, and then eventually the coordinator will look into that problem. He's been doing that a long time, and then he does that in that place. People look at him, they say, ah, ah, you will become president of Nigeria. The way you solve problem, the way you make people to calm down, the way you will stop prioritizing in the place of work, and a lady there will see the man and say, ah, Mr. So-and-so, all these good, good things you are doing, when are you going to get married? Oh, and the brother will begin to witness, begin to, you know, talk a uh, gospel. And eventually, this lady in the place of work will be thinking, if I marry this uh, man, I will never suffer. Never get angry. He's always smiling. He uh, said, when, uh, whenever you are sick and you're on sick leave and, and you come back, you'll say, why were you not uh, here yesterday? He's too caring, too caring. And uh, anytime I say I have uh, any problem, I don't have anything, if I want to follow him to his church, he will provide a lot, all the things that I need. If I marry a person like this, I will never suffer in my life. Unbelieving woman. I will begin to, you know, come to the desk of Mr. So-and-so and, -so and uh, take his biro and borrow his pen and uh, do this and do that. Eventually, Mr. So-and-so too, he'll get uh, interested and say, ah, if I remain this uh, zonal leader now, and they say, they hear that I'm marrying a person like this, everybody will be shouting and crying. Therefore, he'll begin to step down on the, being a zonal leader and talk to coordinator and say, you know, coordinator, how I love this work of God. He'll not tell you what's in his mind. He will say, but you know, uh, the work in our office now is too much. And the load, the load is too much. It, in fact, uh, except I resign, I don't know what I will do. Our coordinator will say, don't resign. Don't resign. What I will go if you can give me some time off. So that uh, you put another person there. And then after you put another person there, eventually he will not be coming to Sunday worship. He will not be coming to Monday Bible study. Brother so and so, what's the matter? Uh, there is no problem. There is no fear. Only too much work. Too much work. On Sunday, too much work. On Monday, too much more work. Eventually, you hear, when you go to Brother so and so's house, you find uh, a woman there with chain in the neck, earring in the ear. Every, you say, Brother so and so, who is this? <laughs> That's what I find, though. <laughs> you go and ask her. And then you say, Madam, who are you? I'm not madam, I'm Mrs. So-and-so, I'm uh, his wife. What? Brother so-and-so, uh, don't shout. Be praying for me. And madam will think that she is going to enjoy. Madam will never enjoy. She will be like the marinas that allowed Jonah to come into her boat. Suffering will begin. Difficulty will begin. And if uh, this man, who had been very kind before, who had been very prayerful before, if he prays, there will be no answer. Because he said, Jonah, you know what? God will be waiting for him. You know, some of, our, some of our zonal leaders who have gone now, they're now in business. They think God has uh, stopped with them. No, God is still expecting them back. That work of zonal leader is still there. That work of being a minister of the gospel is still there. The 120,000 people that should be converted through Jonah, they are still waiting. My friend, they are still waiting for you. If you go away, you are coming back. Because God loves you. He cannot, you know, if you go away like that and you don't come back, how will you get your reward? You will get your reward. But before you come, uh, there will be thorn in your side. 
there will be weep at your back. My friend, never, never go away. You know, you are a zonal leader or you are a woman representative or you are an area leader. And all the people in your area, they love you because anytime they have any trouble, they will be, they will be saying, ah, uh -uh, uh, sister, already you are there. And the moment you get there, you'll be taking care of them. You'll be doing wonderful, wonderful things. You know, they are praying for you. And anytime you get discouraged and the devil is saying, are you going to stay at just area leader, area leader all the time? And all the time you are in their house, in the night you are in their house, in the morning you are in their house. If you allow the devil to discourage you and you go away, you are coming back. Because all the people you have been praying for before, they will be crying over you. Their tears will not allow heaven to rest. And when people of God cry over you, they say, where is our mother in the Lord? Where is our area leader? Where is our mother in the Lord? Where, where is our father in the Lord? Where is our house fellowship leader? Where did he go? Anytime they see you, even if you go, if you go back and you wear jewelry and you paint and everything, when they see you in the bus like this, you have been their area leader before, you have been their zona leader before, you have been their woman representative before, or you have been their house fellowship leader before. They see you in the bus and maybe you are a man and they, they say cigarette in your mouth. All through that way, they'll be crying day and night over you. And when they cry over you, you are in trouble. If the people of God say, oh Lord, our leader, our father in the Lord, our mother in the Lord, where has he gone? And then you who are ladies, here now we are together. The people you are caring for. You know, some of us, uh, if uh, you are sick and you are talking, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to die, your hospitalship uh, members will say, ah, don't talk death, don't talk death. Who will be our house leader? And you will say, other people are there. I am going. I'm going to my They say, no, you cannot go. Because they don't know, even though they know there are other house fellowship leaders, it is you they know. It is you that is their mother or their father. And if you backslide and they see jewelry in your ear or chain in your neck, they see you in the bus or they see you in the school where you are teaching, anywhere they see you, if they don't cry there, they'll go back immediately and be crying. And if they cry on you, you are in trouble. You see Jonah, he was over there with the mariners. And all the people, they started rowing. They just started making all their efforts, whatever they could do. And eventually, they saw him sleeping. They said, Jonah, oh sleeper, what are you doing there? And then he began to tell them the story. That he is a minister of the word of God. They became afraid. Look at verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous, and he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. He said, I will never preach again. He said, Lie, he will preach again. He said, I will, that Nineveh, I will never get there. Whatever happens is a lie. You will get there. But before you get there, you will tell us story. My brother, never go away. This is our God. God will not kill you. you th some people, they will be praying, those pastors, God killed them. Mm -mm, God will not kill them. They are coming back. They are still going to join us in this work. They are still going to join us in the ministry. And you who are here already, if you love yourself, stay where you are. Even when you are tired, stay where you are. When you are weak, stay where you are. When it appears that you say, I cannot take another step again, I cannot preach again, I cannot pray again, even if you cannot preach or pray, don't tell anybody, just stay where you are. Because, you know, if we go away from the Lord, after God has called us, after God has appointed us, the trouble will be indescribable. But I thank God for you are here today. We have no other place to go. We are going to serve the Lord. We are going to preach the gospel. If there is poverty today, don't worry. Poverty will turn to prosperity. If there is sickness today, don't worry about that. That's only for today. Tomorrow will be different in Jesus' name. But eventually, they picked him up. Because that's what he said. And they had to throw him into the sea. So, verse 15. They took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased 
from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now, I want to tell you something here. Jonah was a backslider. All these mariners, they were idol worshippers. Did you see originally in verse 5 that they prayed unto their gods? Unto their gods. Because they did not know the almighty God. But even though Jonah was a backslider, what happened to him created fear in their heart. It says in verse 16, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. And they even made vow unto the Lord and said, Lord, from what we have seen on the stormy sea, from the punishment on Jonah, and we have shared in it, we now vow, we consecrate our lives unto you. The purpose of God will always be fulfilled. Even the Jonah that was running away, he became an instrument of making these people to know that the God of Israel is the only true God. But there will be no reward for that one because he didn't do that willingly. Because that happened. Just because of the method that God used. But eventually now, they put him in the sea. And in verse 17, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. Some of you didn't eat this morning, but Jonah did not eat three days, three nights. No lunch, no supper. Some of you have been saying, well, this is a retreat, accommodation. You better thank God for what you have. You have a bench to sit, to sleep upon. Praise the Lord. You have some little water to wash. Praise the Lord. If Jonah got a bench, that will be another story. There was no bench. It was in the whale's belly. That man began to suffer. You see, brothers and sisters, some of us suffer because of our disobedience. Our disobedience in not wanting to lead the people of God to lead the house fellowship, to lead in the area, to lead in the zone, or because of our disobedience in not wanting to preach the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is something that God has called you into. And if you will do it, it will bless your life. It will take sickness away from you. If you will be obedient to the Lord and do what he wants you to do, you will not suffer. Even if there is suffering that the devil is trying to bring up, the Lord will deliver every one of us in Jesus' name. And then in chapter 2, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God, out of the fish's belly. You find a man that says, I will never pray. I will never repent. I will never come back to the walk again. Just be praying for him, he will pray. Just be praying for him, he will come back to the work again. But then, look at what he suffered. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas. The floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The death closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet as thou brought me brought up my life from corruption. O Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. You observe lying vanities. The world is trying to attract you. The devil is trying to attract you. Like the devil spoke to Jesus and said, bow down to me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world and I will give you all the glories therein 
But the Lord knew the reason why he was born and why he came into this world. He said, it is written and for you. When the devil comes to tempt, when he comes to invite you, when he comes to dissuade you and discourage you and move you away from the work that God has committed into your hand, if you obey the devil and you leave the work, suffering can come. Suffering can come because God says, I am God, I change not. Look at Osir, chapter 8. Osir, chapter 8, verse 3. Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. You see, when you are doing the thing that is good, preaching the good gospel, preaching the good news, exalting the good, good and great shepherd, you are doing a good thing, the enemy will be far away from you. Witches and wizards will be far away from you. But if you forsake the good thing, the best thing you can do in this life is to preach the gospel. Is to lead souls into the kingdom of God. It is better than your mundane or your secular job. The best thing you can do in this world is to tell people, tell the lost of the people, of the uh, people, the people that are perishing, tell them of the gospel of the Lord. When you forsake that good thing, the enemy, the devil, the witches, the wizards, he will pursue such an individual. I'm not saying that so as to give the weep into the hands of the devil. I'm saying that so that we will not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. The enemies know that as long as we are in the center of the will of God, he will never catch us. Remain in the center of the will of God. But if anyone forsakes the thing that is good, the enemy will pursue him. And do not mind the dreams that you may be having. You know, sometimes you can have a dream. And that dream can tell you, you ought to be a great politician. Or that dream may be reminding you, you ought to be doing another thing, which is secular, which is just something of the world. Don't think that that is God talking to you. Because the callings of God are without repentance. If God has called you to be an evangelist, he will never change his mind. If God has called you to be a pastor, he will never change his mind. If God has called you to be a soul winner, he will never change his mind. If God has called you to be a proclaimer of the good news, he will never change his mind. Whatever dream the devil may be bringing your way and saying, leave that house fellowship, leave that area, leave that woman uh, care as a woman representative, and leave that zone as a zonal leader, and leave the work of a coordinator as a coordinator, because uh, after all, you have to do this and do this and do that, and look for an excuse whereby you will not do that thing again, that's the devil. Or can that be God? I said, can that be God? Will God tell a person not to talk about Jesus again? Not to encourage other people again? Not to pray for people again? Not to bring souls into the kingdom of God again? God cannot do that. And if you forsake the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue such an individual. In Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. Verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. A time came in the life of Jeremiah. He suffered. He was persecuted. He was misunderstood. He was misrepresented. And they misconstrued or misinterpreted his message. And because of that, some people persecuted him. Then he said, I will not make mention of him again. I will not speak in his name anymore but then his word was in my heart as a burning fire the word of god you have received in your heart all the consecration you have made to the lord all the commitment you have made to the lord all the sacrifice you have laid upon the altar everything will become like a fire inside you will be burning you will be nagging you will be destroying within when you close your mouth and you say, I do not want to preach again. I do not want to serve the Lord again. Now why will you say that if it were not because of discouragement? And you know the devil will always try to discourage. 
And the devil will tell you, you are no good. You cannot make it. The devil will tell you, you are not the kind of person that they need in that church. Nobody recognizes you. Nobody appreciates you. Nobody values your contribution in the church. That's the devil. And what, whatever people say or do, we know that it is God that will give us reward. It is not man that will give us reward. Or is it man that will reward us? It is God who will reward us. But you see, some things happened in the life of Jeremiah. You see, as we are in the zones together, of course we know. Sometimes because of uh, maybe our lack of understanding, because we don't understand how you feel, because we do not understand what you are going through, because we do not understand the emotions in your heart. Some of us believers, maybe we're foolish in our actions to you. Maybe we're inconsiderate in our actions to you. Maybe we didn't care for you like we ought to care for you. But that should not make you to say, I will not make mention of him again. The Lord has not offended you. Maybe we offended you. Maybe fellow brothers and sisters offended you. But God never offended you. And then Jeremiah said, I will not speak anymore in his name. Why? Even though some people in the zone, some people in the area, some people in the district might have misunderstood you. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We shouldn't say, I will not do this again. When Jeremiah concluded like that, the word of the Lord was in his heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He began to suffer. The suffering was because of what he left undone. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. From verse 47. Luke 12, 47. And the servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Some people think that this verse is relating to the last day. And they usually think that if somebody knows the will of God, the mind of God, and he does not do that will of God and does not follow the mind of God. He will be beaten with many stripes after death or after the second coming of Christ. That's a limited interpretation. The suffering is not limited to after you have died or after Jesus has come in this world. Now you tell me. If somebody knows the will of God in marriage, he knew the master's will. He knew the will of the Lord. That this is a person he ought to get married to. And he does not do that will of God. And he goes to marry another person of his own choice, of our own choice. When will that person be beaten with many stripes in this world? He knew his master's will. He knew that this is a marriage God would like me to get into. But because maybe because of ambition. Or because he wants a rich man. Or because he wants a person with certificate, he goes to do contrary to the will of God. When will he suffer? When will he be beaten with many stripes in the world now? The same thing, you know the will of God, that you ought to evangelize. You know the will of God. You ought to be reaching out to the people that are perishing. You know the will of God in your zone. You know that there are sinners there. Anytime I go to a council in the district, and, you know, we go on and on and on and i see crowds of people i'll be wondering all these crowds of people are here in this community all these crowds of people are here in this region and yet from this zone we only have about 400 people coming to church with all this teeming multitude all this crowd you know the people are there you know the will of the lord the will of the lord is that they will not perish now god wants to use you to get involved in accomplishing the will of God, preaching the gospel unto them. But if you do not prepare yourself, and if you do not preach the gospel, if you do not reach out to them, you have seen the case of Jonah, you have seen the case of other people, the same thing will happen to you because you are forsaking the thing that is good. And then it says the suffering will be much in John chapter 21. John 
chapter 21, verse 3. Simon Peter said unto him, I go a fishing. Unfortunate. That Peter had been called of the Lord. Oh yes, we know his problem. We know that he denied the Lord. But don't you remember? When Jesus rose from the dead, the angel said unto the women, Go and tell his disciples and Peter. He mentioned Peter in particular. You see, sometimes we allow our mistakes of the past, our shortcoming of the past, our foolishness of the past to tie our hand, to discourage us. And the devil begins to tell us, you denied the Lord, you compromised your faith, you told a lie, you said you didn't know the Lord in public, you rejected the Lord in public, the Lord will never use you. Maybe the devil was talking to Peter that way. The same thing, the devil might have been talking to us. I might have been saying, you made that mistake, you made that uh, flaw, and you did that thing wrong, and why don't you pack it up? Because already you've messed it up, and there is no hope. And God will never use you again. You will never be a preacher again. You will never be able to do anything significant again. If you stay there in that work of God, you'll hinder people from getting saved because you know God is not going to use you anymore. It's a lie of the devil. Maybe that is what Peter was hearing. And then he said, Please, uh, brethren, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. You know what? When somebody who had been a great preacher, who had been encouraging other people. When he gets encouraged and he falls down, all the other people say, well, if so-and-so is falling, how can I stand? If so-and-so cannot do the work again, how can I do it? You see, if you, are, if you are familiar with farming, when you see a big tree, if that big tree falls down, a lot of other trees will be crushed in the falling. And God has, been, God has chosen you he has been depending upon you. And through you, many people have been encouraged through your activities, through the method of uh, your praying, of your preaching, of following up, of caring for people. Other people have said, I just like to be like brother so-and-so. I like to care like brother so-and-so. I like to be like sister so-and-so. If you fall, if you give up, if you say, well, I don't think I can continue again because of a little problem. Or maybe a great problem because the problem of Peter was a great great problem great problem because of that great problem if you say I will never do anything again you will discourage other people so other people they say unto him we also go with thee they went forth and entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught nothing you know why it was not the will of God for them to be fishermen again and because it's not the will of God, they were outside the will of God, they caught nothing. There was poverty. When Jesus sent them out two by two, he said, the hire, the laborer is worthy of his hire. That even though you are going out with nothing, all the money you need, all the care you need, all the food you need, all the accommodation you need, everything will be given unto you. But now, they didn't want to live by faith. They wanted to live by sight. And they forsook everything. And that night, they caught nothing. But you know, God is wonderful. You know, God has love. We should be, love, we should be learning from the word of God and from Jesus every time. You know, Jesus did not abandon them. I told you that the people who have been working for God before, and maybe they are not doing the work now, God has not written them off. And we should not write them off. That's why I believe they're still going to work for God. That's why I believe they're still going to do something great for the glory of God in Jesus' name. And so Jesus came there and said, Children, he didn't call them backsliders. Oh, we need to learn from Jesus. We need to learn from his language. He said, Children, he knew they had backsliding. He knew they had dropped what they, what they should have been doing. He knew that they had a problem, but he said, Children, my brother, my sister, you are a child of God. You might have made your mistake. Why are you thinking, I'm no more a child of God. I'm just uh, in the workers' meeting. They just invited me. 
The pastor doesn't know my life. He doesn't know I'm totally discouraged. He doesn't know he's just speaking to us as if he thinks I'm a worthy person. I am unworthy. My brother, you are worthy. My sister, you are worthy. He knows that your God is couraged. He knows what you need. He knows that people misunderstood you. He knows that it is, you know, you are thinking because of my failure, because of the mess I made of my life, because of a lie I told, because of all the things I did. I know the Bible because without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Since God is a pure God and is a holy God, how can he use a person like me that has denied the Lord? God is not a man that he should repent. He cannot change his mind. He called you. He knew your present. He knew your future. And he's able to wash over the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore he said, children, have ye any bread? They said, no. And Jesus did not condemn them. Did not, yes, you will never have bread. You know, we should learn from Jesus Christ. And do not just bury people before they die. Don't kill our people. If they are discouraged, don't beat them. Don't knock them. Somebody who is on the ground already. We shouldn't stamp on him and march on him. The only thing we can do is to remove all the load we have in our hand and put it aside and use your two hands to lift them up. And Jesus began to lift them up. And he said, throw your net there. And they caught multitude. And then before they came to the seashore, he had cooked for them. You know, it's Jesus and he cooked for them. His master and he cooked for them. Is the one that overcame the cross and death and the devil and hell and he cooked for them. Is the glorified Christ, the glorified resurrected Christ. And look, look at Jesus Christ. Oh, this Jesus is a wonderful Savior. You see, he will care for you. He will care for you. You say, well, I don't know God, if God will ever heal me. God will ever do anything for me. Oh, don't you know Jesus? Don't you know Jesus? If you don't have any bread, he will provide for you. Oh yes, he knows your mistake. He knows you are discouraged. He knows that you are saying, I will never work for God again. But you will work for God. You will work for God. Don't you remember the day of Pentecost? This is the same Peter. When he saw the love of Jesus Christ, he threw all his net away and then he said, forever now, bye-bye. No fishing again. And 3,000 came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you remember chapter 3 of Acts? It, God manifested his power through that man. And remember, remember, the day of Pentecost was just 50 days ago. 50 days after Jesus Christ was crucified. It was not up to two months. And a man that had said, I'm going back to my net. I will never be useful again. Not up to two months. God gave him 3,000 souls. Our God is wonderful. God will do the same thing for you. He will use every one of us in Jesus' name. Now that you have seen, the reason why many of us suffer, and we do not need to suffer, what is the remedy? The remedy for our sickness. The remedy for our poverty. The remedy for our oppression. Let us look at Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. From verse 10. Job 42, 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job as much as he had before. Can you see? Job had been sick. Maybe you are sick today. And you have said, I cannot pray for anybody now. I'm going to leave the prayer warriors alone. Look at me. I've been in the prayer warriors. I'm sick. I'm almost dying. And I have all this torment and all this oppression. You see, Job, the captivity of Job was turned away when he ministered, when he prayed, when he got all his friends that misunderstood him and he prayed for them. God has given you a prayer ministry. God has given you a ministry of reconciliation. God has given you a counseling ministry. God has put so much in your hand when you pray for your friends, when you pray for the backsliders, when you look for the other people and you bring them back into the gospel. Then the Lord will turn your captivity. Whatever captivity you have today, everything will be turned. Look at Jonah again that we read before. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. He had not done it. He only promised it. 
Our God is a good God. Immediately Jonah said, Oh Lord, I realize my mistake. I've been running away from your work. And even with those marinas, I did not uh, positively preach the word of God. I just told them, I will continue my rebellion. Throw me into the river, into the sea. But now, O oh Lord, I change my mind. I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will give my testimony. And I will pay that that I have vowed. I remember my vow. When you called me, I said, I will preach the gospel till I die. I said, I will go wherever you wanted me to go. I said, I will do whatever you want me to do. I said, I will give what you, wanted me, what you want me to give. I said, I will minister to any group of people, whether they are rich or poor, whoever you send me to. I said, here am I, Lord, send me. I remember my vow. I will pay my vow. And immediately, he had not done it, he only promised. Immediately, the Lord spake to the fish, and he vomited out Jonah, upon the dry land you see the remedy for our suffering when you decide and you say i now renew my vow i renew my consecration you know when i started the message i really saw the commitment of our people i know that uh, you know some of us were hungry and uh, you are outside looking for food looking for bread and you know by the time i we got here we started singing some people were rushing back when i said let us pray i saw people they were running they were running they were running back you love the lord god cannot overlook people like you he cannot neglect people like you we love the lord if there is anything that has discouraged us god knows his discouragement he will take everything out of the way what we need to do is to do like Jonah and come back to God and say, God, I know my vow. I know what I laid upon the altar before. I have come back fully now. And God will come back fully to you. And every blessing from heaven, it will overload you with blessing. It will enrich your soul. It will enrich your body. It will enrich your family. Everything that you have lost, it will bring everything back to you. And through you, thousands of souls will still be saved. Let us rise up and make our vows again to the Lord. Make our consecrations back to the Lord again. And say, Lord, we're sorry for going back before. We're sorry for looking back before. We're sorry for getting discouraged before. We will serve you. We will serve you. We will preach the gospel. We will do what you want us to do. Let's tell the Lord. No more discouragement. No more backsliding. No more refusal to do the work of God. A place in the church of God. God has chosen you. You have a ministry in the church of God. Renew your vow. I will pay my vow, which I have vowed unto you. Renew your consecration. I will go where you want me to go. I will serve where you want me to serve. I will do what you want me to do. I will preach what you want me to preach. I will serve you. I will serve you. I will serve you. Renew your consecration. I will go where you want me to go. I will serve where you want me to serve. I will do what you want me to do. I will preach what you want me to preach. I will serve you. I will serve you. I will serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In 
Jesus name we pray. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you because of your love. We thank you because you think about us every day. We thank you because it is not your will that any of us should continue to suffer. And we thank you because of the way you have opened our eyes this afternoon to see the remedy to whatever suffering that are now present in our lives. Father, we thank you. Accept our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Our Lord and our God, we have seen the reason why we suffer many a times. We have seen the reason why we are unable to receive or to obtain or to enjoy all that you have promised and purposed for our individual lives. Father, we are praying that whatever disobedience that is still lurking in our lives, whatever discouragement, whatever backsliding that is plaguing any of our lives, we pray that you forgive us this afternoon in Jesus' name. In whatever way we have lived contrary to your own will. In whatever way we have lived contrary to your purpose for our lives. In whatever way we have deviated from your blueprint which you want us to follow. Father, we pray. And these have brought one suffering or the other into our lives. We pray that you forgive us in Jesus' name. Remove discouragement from our lives. Remove by sliding far away from us. Father, we pray as we see ourselves at this workers' retreat, both those of us here and those of us that are not here now, Father, and we rejoice together. We pray that on the last day, on the day of reckoning, on the day those that served you till the end, we'll be rejoicing in thy presence. Count us worthy on that day in Jesus' name. Help us by your law. Grant us the grace to do that which you have committed into our hands. We thank you because you have answered. In Jesus' name.